Here we are in the Far East, speaking to you from the land of enchantment. No expression more fitting could be used to describe the Isles of Japan, which her people lovingly call the country favorite of the gods. How well they believe this is shown by the 196,000 temples like these throughout the land in honor of the many hundred legendary gods. This great eastern temple of Hangwan-ji at Kyoto, one of the largest wooden buildings on earth, was made possible by contributions by the faithful. Devoted women cut their hair and braided ropes 200 feet long and 16 inches in circumference with which they hoisted the massive timbers into place. Here can be seen three of the original 29 immense ropes of human hair, indicating one of the greatest sacrifices known to man. Here is a zigzag bridge built to confuse the evil spirits who, according to tradition, always travel along straight lines. The charming beauty of the arched foot bridges which span the moats surrounding the temple gardens is enhanced when we learn from the old traditions that the lotus blossoms which bejewel the sparkling waters constitute the legendary keys to the throne room of the gods in the great beyond, while the bridges themselves symbolize the wondrous crossing that leads from earth to paradise. And here we are over modern Tokyo. The rise of this eastern metropolis from the ashes and the earthquake wreckage of old Yedo may well be considered the great romance in the building annals of the world. It is hard to realize that a little more than 30 years have passed since this great business center was a field of grass and rice gardens. A far cry indeed from the lonely fishing hamlet of gnarled pines and sand where Commodore Perry established the first American trading port in 1853 in narrow, crowded streets. Contrasting with the prized modern city, we find the masses of the many millions of Japan's children still live in the same manner as did their ancestors in the centuries that have passed. Here is one busy merchant who has solved the rent problem. His business is on his own shoulders. In no other land is it possible to find mothers more interesting or charming, and much of the enchantment is due to them and the loving care of the cutest and cleanest babies in the world. Women also accomplish much of the labor of the country. Here is a party driving piles by the same method used in the beginning of Japanese history, their average wage being 12 cents a day. Leaving them, we enter Nara. The name for this gate is Torii, meaning bird's rest. Torii itself resembles the written character indicating heaven, birds and heaven, a wonderful thought to include in the welcome of the open gateway. We are told that the hundreds of deer that so readily obey the call of the park shepherd are sacred. They are all lineal descendants of the original pair loved by the gods and brought to Nara to be deified when the first temple was erected here by an ancestral hero. The land of enchantment is a land of festivals and parades. The calendar shows one for almost every day. The most impressive and graceful of all parades is the famous festival of the Hollyhock. Robed priests bear baskets filled with offerings to the gods. Huge umbrellas covered with the sacred wisteria, azalea and hollyhock are borne by officials of the temple. A great chariot, draped with blossoms, drawn by a richly caparisoned ox and dedicated to the spirit of Japan's first emperor is sacred to the memory of his daughter beloved by the people through the centuries. The rivers and inland seas abound in many species of fish, which the Japanese have a novel way of catching. For a thousand years they have used trained birds. Each of the fishing boats is equipped with a working crew of 16 diving cormorants, about whose necks the men tie loops to keep them from swallowing the catch. Cheered by the winsome geisha girls, the sport goes on. A good crew of birds kept hungry where there are plenty of fish will often bring up 150 in an hour. 
In the mountainous districts where there are no roads, we pass a party of silk producers who have brought a cargo of the product for which their country is famed to the market by way of the swift mountain streams. After delivering the bales of raw silk, they are compelled to journey homeward on foot, climbing laboriously along the rocky shore and towing their craft upstream against the rapids, aided now and then by the breeze that fills their queer sails. Rice being the staple food of the people, they have many rice planting festivals. At the beginning of the planting season in locations selected by the emperor, unmarried girls chosen for their beauty and purity transplant the seedlings and dance in supplication to the gods of earth and sky to ensure a bountiful harvest. On the southern coast of the mainland is a little inland sea dotted with charming isles and known as Gokasho Bay. Here we find man, nature, and the lowly oyster working in unity in the most romantic and probably least known industry, the growing of pearls, originating in Japan and made possible by the life work of Kokicho Mikimoto. Vast colonies of young oysters are watched by the bewitching eyes of lovely maidens who have become proficient in diving and handling the boats on which they spend most of the daylight hours. Their day begins early, and sunrise finds the boats arriving at the beds where millions of young oysters have been growing for four years in readiness for the task imposed upon them of making jewels to enhance the beauty of the world. In preparation for diving, each of the mermaids of Gokasho places a bandeau about her hair to keep it from her eyes. They all wear white cotton gowns instead of bathing suits, and each has a watertight glass for eye protection. At a given signal, they plunge into the bay and at once begin the day's collection of bivalves. The girls are as much at home in the water as on land and unerringly select handfuls of oysters of proper age, bringing them to the surface in less than a minute to place in the floating tubs. Three millions of new oysters, a year old, are placed annually in the bay to roam at will while maturing, thus ensuring a continual supply. Girls have been found superior to men for this work. They have great lung capacity and can better withstand the cold and fatigue. Working in 15-minute relays, a lively girl brings up an average of 1,000 oysters a day. Here we see one bring up a starfish, dreaded enemy of the growing oyster. As soon as possible, the filled tubs are taken ashore and the oysters are cleaned and sorted. This part of the work also being performed by girls. In the laboratory, the oysters are passed to men operators who carefully open the bivalves and insert a tiny but perfect sphere of muscle shell between the stomach and kidney of each. The oysters are then taken back to the bay to toil as willing slaves for six long years. They must, for their own protection, however, lie as prisoners in wire cages suspended from a raft where they are safe from the starfish or the dreaded poison current that occasionally sweeps in from the sea. During all these years, layers of opalescent beauty are being formed around the little sphere of mussel shell, as shown by the sectional view of the growing pearl. On their tenth birthday, they go again to the laboratory. Their labor ended to give up their lives and yield their precious burden to the skilled hands that reclaim the finished shimmering pearls. Think of handling a million and more of such marvelously beautiful jewels each year. The gems worth a king's ransom are sorted and graded. Behold a finished product. This exquisite fan presented to his august majesty, the emperor, contains 2,012 perfectly matched jewels. Sailing away from the harbor at Yokohama on a modern steamship, product of the second largest naval organization in the world, we acclaim these idealistic and practical nature worshipers who have so harnessed the forces of nature that the charm and romance is felt around the world.
And as the glorious setting sun wraps a mantle around the land of enchantment, we bid them a fond farewell.